This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back my good friend, the hilarious, the beautiful, the talented Anita Wise. And guess what we are going to do today? We are going to nerd out on the entertainment of our youth. And I've been thinking about, I, I was thinking for a while about reaching out to Anita to do a nerd out, and I finally did it last week, and uh, today we're going to have a great talk talking about film, television, theater, music from our childhoods. It's funny, you know, my birthday is three days before hers. She's also a Gemini. I'm June 6th, she, she's June 9th, and it's going to be... A pretty hilarious and interesting conversation. I cannot wait. I hope you all had a happy Passover. Happy birthday, Jack Nicholson, one of the greatest actors that has ever lived and one of my top three favorite actors of all time. Little Shop of Horrors, Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, The King of Marvin Gardens, Carnal Knowledge. The Last Detail, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown, Wishes of Eastwick, Batman, so many great movies. Also, happy belated birthday, three-time guest, Lois Bromfield, one of the funniest ladies ever. Oh my god, we have nicknames for each other. I'm fucker, and she's twat. Love you, Lois. Happy birthday. So yeah, here is my new interview with Anita Weiss. Hi, Tommy. Hey, Anita. Welcome back. How are you today, love? I'm well. How are you? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. I'm good. Yep, everything's very good right at this moment. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, going back in time, do you remember the first movie that had an impact on you as a child? Yes. It was uh, Disney's Fantasia. Oh, that's a good one. And it was... I was enjoying it until Mickey did something he should not have done, which was to play with the wizard's broom. Mm -hmm. or something. Anyway, he began to uh, be in a situation where there were uh, an overflowing well or some situation that got out of his control. You know? Yeah. Flowing or I don't know. Anyway, he was going to be in big trouble when he found that when he got caught. And um, and I totally related to that. And, and to me, it was a bit of a horror movie at that moment. So um, yeah. it ended up fine, but that was a movie that had a big impact on me. And whenever I hear the Fantasia theme, mm -hmm. I get a little tense inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I never looked at it that way. That is true. It is kind of like a horror movie. Well, mostly not, but um, but at that moment, yeah, where where he lost control of the situation that as a result of doing something he shouldn't have. I had total, total relating to that, <laughs> and uh, I was worried for him, but uh, he, he was fine, he was fine, yeah. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Yeah, um, Back to the Future was the first movie that had a true impact on me, too. Um, I always had that fantasy of going back in time and seeing my parents in high school and finding out why they're so fucked up and I'm so fucked up. <laughs> You know, so yeah, because I was always looking at their yearbooks and stuff, and I've always had a reverence of the past that way and, and everything. So, yeah, I could totally relate. So that was uh, that was impactful for you. So what what was your takeaway on that? I just think to this day it's still the the best movie ever made. It's just got everything: comedy, drama. Action, sci-fi, horror, music, everything. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful uh, movie. Robert Zemeckis and all his influences of Billy Wilder and John Ford and Frank Capra and all the great directors is in that movie. 
You're a good point. Yeah, it it's one I never mind. Like you know, if I just stumble across it, flipping channels or whatever, I never mind sitting in for some of it because it's it's just it was a good romp that movie. Yep. Sure was. Yeah. Yeah. What genre did you gravitate toward the most? I gravitate towards um, combination comedy and drama. You know, like mm -hmm. um, let me think. Well, like I love Fargo with um, um, William oh, H. Macy and uh, Francis McDormand. Yes, all those people, and and um, yes, William Macy. Steve Buscemi, yep. uh, Francis Dorman. It was it was so. And then whoever the the villain was, um, well, didn't he play also the villain in Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. That guy. Oh God, what's Wasn't his name? It, was that him? I think so. Yeah, but it's not it's not Anthony Hopkins. But yeah, I know who you're talking about. My I don't even know if it's the same, but he felt the same. Anyway. Um, that I thought that was a, a little jewel of a, you know, it it was so grisly and gr and I love Pulp Fiction too for the same reason, you know, it's oh, like, yeah. hi, you know, high drama and then just like, just crazy stuff, yeah. So I love those kinds of movies. Uh, uh, I like those. Oh yeah, Pulp Fiction is a masterpiece. I love that. What, um, let's see, yeah, I mean, I, I loved horror and comedy. Those were my favorites. As far as comedies go, I was a huge Jerry Lewis kid. Uh, I loved the Pink Panther movies, Mel Brooks, Don Knotts movies like The Incredible Mr. Limpet, uh, comedy team stuff like Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello, the Marx Brothers. Oh, yeah, I loved those guys. I loved, when, when I was a kid, uh, my mother, my mother side of the family is French. She was French. And we would go to France. And there was actually in Paris at one time a little movie theater that only played Laurel and Hardy movies. Oh. And that for these movies, Laurel and Hardy um, learned their lines in, in like totally phonetically. It's not like they knew how to speak French, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, they would... You know, it was their voices speaking somewhat French, you know, with a like a very flat footed American accent, like, like for that's a good idea, Ollie, it would come out, ça c'est une bonne day, Ollie. Yeah. And uh, it was so much fun. It was so much fun to see that. I loved it. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love the flying deuces. Uh, where they're in the Foreign Allegiance, um, uh, Way Out West, uh, which is the the Western that they were in. They did this short called Be Big, where they they uh, where uh, Oliver has to pretend to to be sick, so him and uh, Stan can go to the stag party at the uh, at the men's club that they're a member of. But they're but uh, the wives come home. Um, at last minute, and they're having trouble getting the uniform on. It's so funny. <laughs> Oh, I I love them. Their humor is like so sweet and gentle, and yeah, yeah. And Stan Laurel, I saw a footage of him. I don't know how common it is. I, it was at a, a lecture or something like that. He was a leading man, oh, Stan yeah. Laurel. And then there was footage of him from the you know before he got together with uh, with Oliver. <sighs> Oliver, yes. Um, and uh, and uh, and it was very funny to see him be different than you know that little kind of mildly um, backward kind of guy. Well, Stan Laurel, you know, he was a um, he was a uh, vaudeville uh, comedian. He was Charlie Chaplin's best friend for a lot of years. And Oliver Hardy was a serious actor, and they had done some movies for Hal Roach Studios, just acting, and Hal Roach said, I think you two should be a comedy team, we could make a lot of money, and that's how that that happened, you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing how that happened, and they, they became, you know, fast friends, and they loved each other till the end. Oh, that's great, that's wonderful, I like that, I, I didn't know all that much about it, um, about them, um, 
So that's nice to hear. But there's a couple of biopics about them, but they just they haven't been done right. Well, somebody ought to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was one in the late '90s where Bronson Pinchot was um, Stan Laurel and um, Gaylord Sartain was Oliver Hardy, and you would think that would be a great combination with those two guys playing playing those those guys, but uh, yeah, the movie was awful. Uh, that's the same. Yeah. Yeah. You? Uh, you you grew up in Philly, right? Yes. Yeah, so did you guys have the million dollar movie? Uh was that like a TV series where they were show- Yeah, it was um it was the UHF station equivalent of like NBC Saturday Night at the Movies. Yeah, it sounds familiar. I I'm not the movie buff that you are, you know, mm-hmm. like in fact I've lived so long that a lot of my memories are very dusty at this point. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're very, you know, I have to like take a sleeve and wipe off um, some of the grime to freshen them up. But that does ring a bell, the million dollar movie. Um, but I, yeah, I can't tell you any more about it than that. It started, yeah, it was a, it was an East Coast thing. Uh, they were doing it in New York, and then, of course, it spread to other parts of, of the Seaborg. And then um, worldwide, you know, HUHF station in America started getting variations on it. Like, we had, um, we had KBHK 44 in the Bay Area, and they would show uh, classic movies um, at, like, 8 o'clock throughout the week and on Saturday nights at 2 a.m., Oh my God, those were my favorites. I got to stay up late on the weekends or during the summer, and I'd see movies like The War of the Worlds, Houseboat with Cary Grant, What's Up Doc, which is one of my favorite movies ever, and uh, The Bad News Bears Go to Japan, stuff like that. Oh, wow. Everything and anything, right? Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, UPN um, ended, ended up coming into the picture for KBHK 44 Paramount, established their own network um, with KBHK 44. And so they're showing, like, all the Parabout movies on the network. Well, that's pretty cool. We just recently Mm -hmm. watched Casablanca Mm -hmm. again, and it was so much more interesting to me this time because I had just finished reading about Josephine Baker. Right. Uh, She was a, a very influential secret agent during World War II and she ended up in Morocco yeah. and and she was helping you know one of her agent buddies had that problem that um, one of the characters in Casablanca had about like being stuck there because they didn't have their papers and couldn't get away and I mean it was a fascinating place during that period I'm sure it's still interesting but um, right then it was like this kind of no man's land diplomatically and um and so i i finally got a lot of things about casablanca uh the movie the Mm -hmm. film you know with a little more knowledge about what was going on at that time so it was very interesting I gotta go back and watch that TV movie about her that came out on HBO in the early 90s. I, I remember it very well when she says, I have died and gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's that's so cool. Uh, did, did you guys have Chili Billy on Chiller Theater there? Was that a little penguin with a hat on? No, no. Oh. He was oh, a that ho- might have been Chilly Willy. I'm not sure. No, I don't know Chilly Billy. No, what no. is that? Chilly Billy, he, okay, he was a horror host in, um, in Pittsburgh uh, for over 20 years on Channel 11. And um, I was curious if, if Philly got him, too. I don't know. I don't, doesn't ring a bell to me. Um, yeah, he's, if he, I was living in... Oh, hmm? sorry, go ahead. If I was living in Philly, I still had a bedtime, so, (laughs) you know, I may not have been up for that, and then I I was living in the Midwest, and then New York, and then just, you know, other places. I did, um, I did make a couple of appearances on Rhonda Shear's Up All Night, um, in LA when I lived there. That was very fun. That was fun. 
Oh my God, I, I I got to interview uh, Rhonda back in 22. It was one of the highlights of my podcasting life and one of the biggest thrills of my life as well because I was such a huge fan of that show. And, you know, she's a stand-up comedian, so she is just yeah. hilarious. And I told her a joke, and she used her husband as the punchline to guess it before I told her what the punchline was. It was so funny. Oh, yeah. No, she's she's amazing. She's I think in Florida now, and she has yes. a bra line, and she I don't uh, I'm sure she's staying very very busy. Um, but yeah, she was a doll. She was a, she was the one who got me an interview with Playboy. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, they were doing they they actually did do you know um, I hate to use the word spread, but I guess it applies in Playboy um, yes. <laughs> for a female comedians. Um, I wasn't comfortable with the level of exposure that they wanted, uh, me to do, but, um, it was a very interesting experience and, uh, some other comics did it. She, she was one of them. And, um, what was weird was I, uh, I felt, you know, kind of flattered to be asked anyway to interview. Yeah. And. Um, at the elevator of the building, after my interview, I ran into Sandy Church, who mm-hmm. is a very sweet woman, um, a dwarf. <laughs> and she had just interviewed, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess, you know, they're looking at all kinds of types. So that was, <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was a little, like, put me back down to earth I was like okay wow anyway <laughs> that, yeah um uh, 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 Chili Billy was the basis for Joe Flaherty's Count Floyd character on SCTV, and you know we just lost Flaherty like earlier this month which was sad I love that guy I was a huge SCTV fan mm. yeah I do I don't know <laughs> do you remember your first drive-in experience Oh, well, not exactly, but it would have been, my first one was when, um, before my parents realized that this was not a fun way to see a movie and get, you know, avoid babysitting fees. Um, (laughs) They would, we would have to be in pajamas and, um, and that was like embarrassing because then you couldn't get out of the car. Yeah. And, uh, and. It was frustrating because I'd be in the back seat, of course, and there'd be people in front of me, my parents, namely, and uh, my brother kicking me in. So, you know, it wasn't that fun, uh, although I did see some movies that way. Um, and then later, much later, I saw um, I saw Star Wars at a drive-in probably the highest I ever was in my life. Thank you, Karen. Um, (laughs) I don't remember much of it, but it was great. I loved it. I could get out of the car because I was dressed and get food and wander around if I wanted. And um, it was a good experience. And I liked that. Oh, and this is kind of funny. On one of my early dates with a man who 20 years later, um, I would begin dating again and marry. Yep. Um, We went to a drive-in that no longer exists, but we ended up, we figured out that the condo we moved to was in the exact spot of the old drive-in that we went to on a date. So that was kind of interesting. Crazy. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) really, right? Life is so bizarre. If you told us uh, uh, back then, (laughs) I don't know what we, we would have thought you were crazy, I guess. And yeah, so... I don't remember what we saw. I don't remember anything about that drive-in movie, except that it was right where we ended up living. So that was funny. Yeah, oh God. So I was two when uh, my parents started taking me to the drive-in. You, you, you don't become a lifelong cinephile um, just by, you know, later in life. You're, you're, your parents, when your parents are taking you to the drive-in at two, yeah, you're going to be a lifelong cinephile. And 
We saw uh, Weird Science and Rambo 2. Now, this was the summer that Back to the Future came out, but my dad, who's not much of a special effects guy, he prejudged the movie in previews, so he, we didn't see it at the drive-in, but when it came out on video, he gave it a chance, and now it's one of his favorite movies of all time, uh, just like it's mine and stuff. But... Uh, there was a there was a there was a three year period where they stopped taking me to the drive in, because I was either falling asleep in the back seat or I was getting out of the car and knocking on windshields. <laughs> yeah, that's not appreciated. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh God, the first time I ever saw Charlie Chaplin, too, my mom had to go complain at the snack bar about something, and she took me with her, and there was this stand-up cardboard poster of Charlie Chaplin, it was a cookie ad for Bagley's Cookies, and I was like, hey mom, I want a cookie just like that man has, and she was like, you don't get a cookie, I'm mad. (laughs) (laughs) Mad at you, or just mad? No, just just mad mad in general, uh, whatever she was complaining about. (laughs) Yeah, she didn't want to give them any money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, my, my dad, he was a teenager in the 70s, right? So, like, uh, he would take, he would go see a, a movie three times because the first two times he was either making out or having sex with the girl in the car. <laughs> oh, oh, good for him. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, you got to see the movie again because certainly he missed certain parts, obviously. Yeah, His so. Mind, he was distracted. The third yeah. time, he would go by himself, and he would see, like, the Groove Tube, or Rocky, or Animal House, stuff like that. Yeah, whatever he felt like seeing. Yeah, that, um, there's, my brother lives up in uh, Western Mass, mm-hmm. and somebody revived a, a drive-in there, and that's big fun, because they, you know, mm-hmm. everybody loves to do that, and I, I kind of wish there were more around here, too. I would, I'm sure the sound is better than it used to be with that, you know, clunky box that would sit Oh, on yeah. The <laughs> Those things were ancient. Windows. They were around forever. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't the best sound quality, you have to admit, you know. But, no, it's a, a summer night, you know, watching that movie is so great. You know, it's funny when uh, the pandemic was going on mm-hmm. and comics were desperately trying to figure out how to keep doing what we do. The drive-in shows, uh, yeah. There were drive-in shows, and uh, that was so funny. Like, people had different ways of showing that um, they were enjoying it. Like, they would honk. So there would mm-hmm. be, like, a little series of honks, but then that would drown out the comics. So so then they took to flashing their their headlights. <laughs> it was, <laughs> we were all trying to adapt. It was very difficult. That part didn't last too long. Um, but, yeah, we tried. We were trying. So that was pretty funny. I went to a couple of those, so uh, challenging times. Yeah, I don't know. I would have been too scared to perform in in, in front of um, uh, 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 a flock of cars, you know, in a drive-in because I'm afraid I'm going to be so terrible. Someone's going to try to run me over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there's that risk. Yeah, or just everybody drive away. That would really be bad too. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's going to happen anyway. Engines revving, people peeling out of the... <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to say the punchline, someone's peeling rubber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm out of here. Yeah, no, that was, a, that was a kooky time. And then trying to do it on Zoom. <laughs> I, even Bob Saget did a couple of those before he passed. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of surreal because... You can't hear anybody, and you really couldn't see, because, like, when they had the gallery, you know, people, sometimes they'd be sitting on their sofa. They're looking at a big screen, but all you see is a room with two tiny people on a sofa. You have no idea if you're getting over or not, you know, because you can't hear anything. It was like, okay, this is... uh, this is unusual, but it was good practice. You know what it was Uh that was great about it was I totally had the impression that really nobody was watching or you know i i was doing material that i wouldn't i wouldn't i would be a little intimidated to do to a live audience because i would be a little worried if they wouldn't like it or not yeah and uh, like i did a a masturbation routine that i started on what you've done here on here twice (laughs) i've done it twice yeah 
Well, anyway, I that was a you know I don't think I would have started doing that on on state. Well, I might have eventually, but yeah, <laughs> you know, it just had this feeling of like nobody's nobody's just just like like dancing like nobody's watching. I was doing comedy like nobody was listening. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. It could have been a late night crowd. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, they could have been sleeping. We don't know. They were <laughs> on the couch. You know, <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. So the uh, the sitcoms that were on TV in the seventies. Were you a big fan of those? Um, some of them, I guess. I I don't remember them. Oh, wait. You know what? I'll tell you the ones I do remember. Um, Get Smart. Of course. I love that. That was the 60s. I love, that was 60s. Um, what was in the 70s? I don't even know. Let's see. There was the Gary Marshall stuff like Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days of Mark and Mindy. There was the Norman Lear stuff like All in the Family, Good Time, Sanford um, and Son, One Day at a Time. Yeah, all the Norman Lear I loved. Mm -hmm. I loved those. So, I wa yeah, I watched those a lot. Um, but some of the others, I, they were on certainly, but I, I wasn't a fan or I wasn't watching them. So, you know, I don't, but I loved All in the Family it was fabulous. In well, fact, I'm dating, I'm dating Archie now, yeah. actually. <laughs> of course. Remember Alice? Alice? Yeah, Kiss My Grits. <laughs> That she's no. like a waitress. She's like a working single mom waitress. It was a Martin Scorsese movie. Alice doesn't live here anymore, and then it became a sitcom. I don't remember that one. No. Interesting. No. It, it ran a long time. It was a very popular show. Well, I told you, I I don't remember much. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't remember Alice. Like that's I remember Alice doesn't live here anymore as a movie title, but I don't think I ever saw it. I don't know what I was doing, but. You know, like for a lot of my adult life, I was working at night, either as a bartender or a waitress or mm -hmm. a comic. So, you know, I didn't watch tons of television once I left the house, you know. Yeah. So. How about the facts of life? I didn't watch it. Okay. <laughs> did you watch the old? I don't know it. Did, did you what? watch the old like seventies variety shows? Oh, like um, Laughing or things like that. Yeah, Sunny and Cher. Yeah, I used to watch those sketches. That was fun. Carol Burnett. Carol Very Burnett. Very fun. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. it's funny because everyone was trying to be laughing after a while, and they failed. You know. Uh, there was, yeah, I mean, there was, there's Dottie and Marie, the Bay City Rollers. There was, there's country singers like Glenn Campbell and Johnny Cash. They all had these variety shows. And it's, it's just like you look at it now and you go, God, what were they thinking? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean, the, that was a magical, because first of all, it was the first time they were doing, what would you say they were doing? They were doing like kind of more edgy comedy. It wasn't just, you know, um, Pablum for the masses. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit political with T Tommy the Smothers and Dick Cavett. Yeah, yeah, all those guys. It was it had a little edge to it, so it was a bit of commentary. So that was kind of new, you know. I yeah. think. Yeah, and uh, the talk shows. Yeah, I mean, there's Cavett, there was Frost, David Frost, there's Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin, and you'd see comedians. That were that were coming up in the um, the the irreverent comedy boom of the seventies, like Freddie Prinz, or Alan Bursky, or Billy Braver, or Gabe Kaplan. Mm hmm. Yep, they'd be on. My my uh, husband T J. Mm -hmm. T J. Tyndall was on the Mike Douglas show uh, at, when he was with the Chambers Brothers. Yeah. And so he was on. He appeared on the Mike Douglas show, but the hosts that week were uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And so, um, at the end of the show, when it was over, um, uh, TJ asked John to sign his guitar, mm -hmm. which he did. And then Yoko offered to do it, and he said, "Oh no, thanks." <laughs> <laughs> 
kind of rude, really. And then, uh, and then, <laughs> he, you know, he was in his twenties at that time, and so he had John Lennon's signature on his um, guitar. And as he kept playing, it, it began to wear off, and people were like, you know, you should, you should like cover it with something so it stays on and he never did and it came off it wore off the guitar and um and then when we got back together way way later you know 30 40 years later i don't know how long long time later i said to him how come you never why why weren't you more protective of um john lennon's signature on your guitar you know back yeah. then why'd you let it just wear off and he said well I thought I was going to be more famous than him anyway. <laughs> My God. Is that, is that cockiness or what? It's, it's true what they say about her. It really is. I mean, God, she is a C word, a real C word. <laughs> I don't want to judge her. I mean, I don't want to judge her because I, I wasn't there, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, she was in a difficult situation. She may not have been nice, but you know what? He was fooling around on her all the time, and yeah, you know, I I don't I don't I don't know. Yeah, I well, just don't know. well, there's that documentary out uh, by the, uh, the 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 woman that he was he was messing around with May Pang, and uh, I tried to get an interview with her. She's a force of nature, and I know a lot of people who've had her on their podcasts and stuff. But uh, God, yeah, that is really really cocky. I have to say. Yes, can you imagine? I mean, he 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 did do a lot, you know. I mean, he played with some like he was very respected, and um, he was on hit records almost every week. He was part of the Sound of Philadelphia. He was in the rhythm section of uh, the Sound of Philadelphia, MFSB, and he played. You know, I, I remember being on a date with him, and the radio was on. All of a sudden, he go, oh. Sh he like shushed me and he turned the radio up so he could hear how a song he had just played on turned out you know because mm -hmm. they would they would lay down the tracks and then the vocals would come in and you know he didn't hear it when it was done until it was on the radio so that was very interesting all that and he was making piles of money and you know he he produced a couple or was on a couple Bonnie Raitt albums he was who worked with Robert his discography is really impressive so mm -hmm. he you know i was not completely unfounded but largely i would say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> largely unfounded but yeah let's see you gotta remember some of the uh, children's educational shows because in the 70s they were they were getting huge there was the the croft brothers stuff like hr puff and stuff and land of the lost and the boogaloos and sigmund the sea monsters yeah, I wasn't watching kids' shows by then. I remember Sesame Street. Um, of course. I had, yeah, but I had a gig cleaning house in New Hope of a guy who was a producer on Sesame Street. Of course, I don't remember his name, but, you know, that's what he did. I thought that was pretty cool. He'd go to New York every day and, you know, work on the set. Yeah. Yep. And Mr. Rogers, I mean, he's based out of Philly, and everybody from Michael Keaton to George Romero, who made Night of the Living Dead, uh, they all worked for Mr. Rogers. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. In, yeah, in that's fact, cool. In fact, um, Betty Aberlin, Lady Aberlin on, on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, she was up for the role of Barbara in Night of the Living Dead, but Mr. Rogers thought that it wouldn't do good for her image since she was on his show, you know, because it's a horror movie. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Huh. Wow. You're, you're, that's interesting. Yeah. Your knowledge always impresses me. It's just encyclopedic, you know, it's amazing. Yep, I, I'm I'm glad I have it as well. <laughs> the the magic yeah. the magic garden. Do you remember that show? Nope. Okay, it was about it was like these two female folk singers. Uh, they were they were both actresses who had a little bit of a folk uh, background playing folk music. One of them was Carol Demis, who I'm going to be having on soon. And it was it was like a kids educational show, and there was puppets and everything. There was that. There was um. Doug and Emmy on the the New Zoo Review. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know them. I don't know them. I I'm sorry. I just it's okay. I never had I never had kids so so far. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> oh, well, I'm still trying. You never know. Uh, anyway, uh, no. So uh, you know, I'm like there's kid stuff past my period of being a kid. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with. No, I don't. S Schoolhouse no. Rock. <laughs> No, don't know Schoolhouse Rock. I do know a woman who founded the School of Rock and Roll, so that's cool. She was, oh, okay. She, <laughs> yeah, that's as close as I can come on that one. American Bandstand. Oh, yeah, now that was out of Philly, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I even dated one of the dancers. Uh, many years later, I was pretty impressed though when he told me he'd been a, one of the regular dancers on American Dan Bandstand. So that was pretty fun, and um, yeah, uh, it, you know, it's like that all happened before I was, you know, I don't think I don't think it was still going on when um, when I could have done it. You know, yeah, I was. It was a generation before me that was doing that, but. Yeah, that's, the, the, you know, Dick Clark and uh, is an icon here. And, of course. Uh, and Jerry Blavitt, who kind of continued the Philly dance tradition. Mm -hmm. We're proud of our dancing. Yep. Yeah, there's Don Kirshner's rock concert, which, oh my God. So just before it was canceled, Andrew Dice Clay made his, his, his TV debut on there where he comes out as, Jer as, as Jerry Lewis in The Nutty Professor and becomes John Travolta. And there's no footage of it like anywhere because back then they were erasing tapes. You know, uh, they, they, they were doing it to save money. They would erase tapes. Uh, um, but like if something like, was a huge ratings winner, they would keep it. But, like, and for the most part, they, they erased a lot of tapes. And so, like, I've heard Andrew Dice Clay say that, you know, he's got no footage of it, and, like, there's none of it on YouTube. I would have loved to have seen it, because he talks about it all the time, because that was his act before he became the Dice Man. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool. Uh, that's that's a very funny premise. Yeah. Yeah. And there was the Midnight Special with Gary Muldeer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of comedians would go on that show as well. Yeah, because back then, you know, the, the comedians, they were opening for musicians. They still are, yep. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't hear about it much because, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, uh, comedy and music, they're in their, their own little um, coexistent world now. Yeah, it seems so. But um, there's a comic, and I can't think which one it is exactly. Might be Bobby Collins. Yeah, Bobby Collins. Somebody, somebody's opening for Wayne Newton, or oh, he's always or, had no, comedians no, open. No, somebody. No, it's Engelbert Humperdinck. Oh yeah. And some comic opens for him. I uh, can't see. I tell my mind is shot, but. Um, I do know of comics who open for musicians. I just can't tell you which ones they are right now. <laughs> no, I, I, I get it. Those guys are so old school. They, they'll they always have comedians open for them. Yeah. Um, musicals. Were you like into like West Side Story or Grease or The Sound of Music? No, that is a genre that I did not like. Really? I mean, I don't, I, well, I didn't relate to it. I saw Oliver in London, and I loved that. And I saw Showboat when I was in London, and that was very fun because I I had a taste of what people, British people, experience when Americans try to do some kind of English accent, and it's you know, yeah. <laughs> and so they were trying to do Southern accents, and it was all over the place. Old Man River. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was amusing watching them like you know <laughs> try to slash through uh, uh, southern drawls and uh, so I enjoyed those I played Oliver's that, that soundtrack over and over again and I've watched I don't know my mother took me to see Sweet Charity uh -huh. and that was kind of fun but basically no I'm not like someone who gravitated to musicals no Yeah, I love 
I loved Hair. That was my first musical I really, like, really, really liked. That was such a groundbreaking, sub, sub, subversive play at its time. And so many actors that we know today started out in that play in the 70s. Uh, uh, Joe Mantegna did, uh, Keith Carradine. In fact, he conceived his daughter uh, backstage of that, of that <laughs> play. Him and Shelley Plimpton wow. had Martha Plimpton. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was a groundbreaking play. There, there are these two twin brothers... Um, they had a hit song in the 70s called Nicole, uh, Peter and Bobby Ellisey, and I had them on the show a couple years ago. They they also did a song for the Ghostbusters soundtrack. They were in hair, and wow. yeah, that, that play began a lot of people's careers. Well, yeah, it was it was like our musical, you know, it was like the, our generation's musical. So, you know, it's the first one that I I personally really wanted to go see, so... And recently, a friend of mine does uh, musical productions, and so he regularly goes to New York, and then he'll go see a bunch of shows just to get the, you know, the pulse of what's happening and yeah. who's doing what. So we went to see Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, I heard it. It got, it got turned into a play. Yeah. It was all right. You know, it was fun. It was the story of Mrs. Doubtfire. and Yeah. You know, it's not Robin Williams, but they did a good job. And, um, yeah, you know, and, and like when I, I uh, to me, musicals are like Chinese food. A half hour later, I'm like, yeah, that was all right. You know, um, you know how they say you're half hour later, you're hungry. Well, that's mm-hmm. sort of how I feel about musicals. Like a half hour later, I'm like, yeah, all right. Yeah. That was good. You know, I'm like, <laughs> it's just not my... It's not my bag or my wheelhouse or whatever you call it anymore. It, it's yeah. cra- it's crazy. Back in the fifties, major networks had these live theater shows like General Electric Theater and Playhouse ninety, and they 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 would get major stars or soon to be major stars uh, to do these live theater plays on television in front of a live audience, and at some point they fizzled out by like 1960 and then by when the 70s came and PBS came PBS started filming live theater uh with 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 name actors and stuff that's like the closest that they have to it um in the last 50 years you know the only difference is now they offer a cassette or DVD of the performance after it's over <laughs> right yeah yeah it's just not the same you know it's obviously not the same but I mean, nothing is the same as watching live theater. But um, I guess, you know, if you can't go, it's good to watch it on a CD. Yeah. So. How, do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? First album? Um, no, I don't remember. Yeah, I was an MTV kid, so like I had Phil Collins, No Jacket Required, and Poisons Look What the Cat Dragged In when I was eight, with birthday money my grandmother gave me. Um, but my, my parents had a big old box of vinyl records from their teen years, and they had everything from the Beatles, the Stones, Fleetwood Mac, Foreigner, Johnny Cash, Live at Folsom Prison, uh, Rod Stewart, all the good stuff. Oh, yeah. They had good taste, very good. You know, I just got a car, um, a car through a friend of a friend, mm-hmm. and um, uh, you know, it's a 2014 car, and I thought, I I believed it didn't have a CD. I didn't see anywhere to. Anyway, I turned on, I turned it on the radio knob or whatever. All of a sudden, the Stones came on, old Stones. Um, the one with, I don't know the title of the album, but um, with I Can't Get No Satisfaction and Paint It Black and all that. And I thought, well, apparently somewhere on here is a CD slot. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> I don't know how to eject it. I don't know where it is, but I was so happy to find it. And so it's so great. to I forget why I started telling you that, but um, I was just happy because now I can play my CDs anyway in this car. Yeah, we're huge Stones fans in my family. Um, Tattoo You, um, 
was like the first uh, record from the Stones that I really, really loved, and I still do. It, it's still one of their biggest selling albums ever, tied with Some Girls, and this was during the New Wave era, you know, and Some Girls had, had of course, um, disco and punk on it too, but like, um, those, those were like two of their most popular albums, but uh, yeah, Satisfaction was on Out of, Out of Our Heads, uh, their 1965 album, and that's, that's a great you know, early Stones album. Yeah, I loved it. When that's about the year I went to uh, that I was in England, mm-hmm. and I bought a Stones album there, and it had some songs that had not been released in in the states. And one day I was playing it, and um, one of my housemates had a new girlfriend, mm-hmm. and she came popping out of the room and into the living room, going, "Where'd you get that?" You know, because she was a huge Stone fan, and so we bonded over that. And I don't, somebody stole the album from me. I pointed out how rare it was. And next thing you know, it was gone. Ah, the days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I love them. I, I, I still. I mean, at, at this point in time, I, I no longer wish to sleep with him, but I still <laughs> think he's pretty great. I still think he's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the first concert you ever attended? Yes, the Beatles. What year was that? 64, I think, or 65. Whatever their first tour. Okay. Here. Yeah, yeah, 64. My, my my mom got to meet them uh, backstage at the Cow Palace in 64. She got their autographs, and my uncle accidentally threw them away. And to this day, ah. she will not forgive them. She will not forgive him for that. <laughs> I, I don't blame her. I'm mad at him, too. Oh, yeah. yeah that, oh, heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But um, uh, Steppenwolf was my first concert. It was at the county fair. The lead singer, John Kay, was the only original member. I could see that all the 40 and 50 year olds were disappointed. You know, the magic was uh-huh. gone, but he is such a charismatic, funny guy. Like, I didn't care. I was 15. I enjoyed it. And then my first, like, true, legit concert was Alice Cooper in 2000. And oh my God, he, he, he is a showman. He'll do like one or two songs from every album he ever recorded, except for the ones where he was fun up you know he's he's i think i think uh you know he doesn't want to revisit those songs and you know he gets killed at the end of every show i keep forgetting how he died at the end of this show i think he hung himself or something maybe he got electrocuted oh my god i can't remember well it's you know he's he's macabre he's theater you know yeah i didn't realize he did that i wasn't that you know i'm not that into him what's the last concert you went to Oh, that's a good question. Which one was it? I think it may have been when I went to go see Joe Walsh and Bad Company in 2016. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, I've made a couple attempts the last couple of years to go to some uh, concerts at the fair, but for whatever reason, I didn't go. But, like... (sighs) I, I don't know. I mean, there's 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 a lot of bands that I've seen in the last decade. They're just not as great as they used to be, sadly. Well, what's happening now, the last one I went to was just a few months ago, and it was Mickey Dolan's oh. the Monkees. He apparently lives in my area now, yeah. like somewhere in the- Somewhere in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I, 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 know, I know his uh, booker for um, his, his appearances. She's, she lives in Philly. She's been on the show. Oh, oh cool. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was good. He had a good band uh, backing him up. And, um, you know, he told pretty cool stories about how songs were, uh, you know, uh, done. None of which I can recall right at this specific moment. But um, it was very interesting to hear how, you know... It, and apparently this is how some of these um, older performers, you know, who still don't have their whole band anymore, yeah. they do that. They, they'll they'll do some of it and then they'll tell stories. And um, but it was very it was very entertaining, very good. I, I appreciated it. What I, what I find really weird is it, like it feels like at a certain point there stopped being any new music mm-hmm. like rock and roll. You know, mm-hmm. it's all tribute bands of our music. And yeah. I'm like, 
isn't anybody doing new rock and roll? <laughs> or maybe I just don't hear it. But I mean, there's there's rap and hip hop and pop and country and everything. Those are new, but the rock and roll just seems. I don't know. In a in a quiet period right now, or they're just sort of rehashing. Uh, I, I, in an embarrassing way, what what used to happen, you know? So, I, I think it's it, rock is dead, but it's being kept alive by classic rock radio. Okay, maybe That's, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Out here in California, FM radio is very popular. I mean, I hear all the classics from my parents' childhood on the radio, like, constantly. Oh, yeah, me too. And that's why I'm like, isn't anybody writing anything new? You know, yeah. maybe they, maybe I'm not on the right station. I don't know. But, you know, it's just, it's like, yes, I, I know that song. I know, uh, yeah, I know the words to this one. You know, it's like, I shouldn't know all the words to all these songs that are coming on. Somebody should be writing something new. They, I guess I, they do new albums, but you have to go on YouTube or Spotify to hear them. Oh, right. Yeah, that's the problem now. The business has changed and it doesn't come out the same anymore. Right. Yeah, you're right. Right, right, right. So I'm not in the wrong venues, I guess. It's not going to come <laughs> to the radio. I did, I did get to interview um, Mickey Dolan's sister. Um, you know, she she's a singer, and she'd go on tour with them and, and sing on stage with them. They were on the last stop of their farewell tour, the Monkees' farewell tour, just a couple of weeks before Michael Nesmith passed. And they were in Missouri, and they had just gotten off the tour bus a couple hours before, and they had to do this very long sound check. I remember I waited like three hours or so before uh, we, we, we did the interview uh, because they got there a little bit later than they had planned, you know. But we talked, you know, a half hour before the, the gig, and I thought that was just so nice of her. She was great. That's lovely, yeah. Especially right before a gig, you know. Yeah. It's like you're tired and you want to, yeah, that was nice. And yeah, and I had a crush on Davey growing up, and I still do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, he was pretty cute. I don't blame you. <laughs> he was. Yeah. Yeah, my mom. You know, she worked for the cable company for many years, right? And she had some um, uh, guys, you know, go to various houses in San Francisco. And Davy Jones had a, a house in San Francisco, and one time. Uh, this one guy she knew went over there, and he was there with like six girls having um, a ba uh, uh, a hot tub orgy. <laughs> oh, nice! Yeah, oh, nice. Uh, that was a quite a florid period uh, uh, in San Francisco. My my housemate <laughs> yeah. was uh, just a young, beautiful young man, um, very young, uh, showed up in. Um, in San Francisco, in the middle of that Haight Ashbury heyday, and uh, he had an affair with Carol Dota, who was oh uh, yes, like the big you know who, the big breasted woman. Know. She hosted the uh, the Action Thirty Six movie when my parents were kids. <laughs> oh well, there you go. Yeah, so you know, but she was a porn star. He said you yes, know? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, well, she chewed him up and spit him out, and uh, but. <laughs> But, yeah, that was his introduction. You know, it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> what did like, she? What did yeah. he say? He was sore after having sex with her or something? <laughs> no, no, I don't mean it that way. I just mean that you know, she. Uh, I guess she had a boyfriend, and so he was in mortal fear of of that guy um, during their affair or whatever. Anyway, I I wasn't there again, so I can't tell you all the details. <laughs> but um, it was. Quite an initiation to San Francisco, let's just say that, you know. Yeah, for, oh God, for, for Carol, Carol Doda, that is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I you know, it's pretty cool. So, Do you remember the uh, first uh, make-out song you ever heard? First make-out song? Yeah, like, do you remember your first make-out song? No, don't. I don't, no. I don't have a make out song. Uh, not like uh, br not like uh, the Hollies, the air that I breathe, or something, or air supply. <laughs> no, it does, I don't feel like I have a make out song. 
No. Uh, okay, mine was uh, Janet Jackson's Love Will Never Do Without, uh, and I was 12, and it led to my first heavy petting experience, which was fantastic, and uh. it brings me back. It's funny, when I hear that song, it brings me back to that, but it also brings me back to the first time I heard it when I was about seven, because I had it on cassette when I was a kid. Wow. Wow, so that's a jumble of experiences right there. Yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't have a music connection to making out, really. Oh, I do actually, I do remember a very heavy, my uh, my heaviest petting experience to date at the time mm -hmm. was um, the cream, um, uh, the what no it might not be the cream the, i'll give you my dull surprise remember that song um dull surprise uh no it doesn't sound familiar all right yeah i i meant to have my laptop handy so i could quick look it up but i, I think it was cream okay yeah how about the comedy albums um well, the very first one I remember was Von Meter oh. doing impersonations of JFK. Yes. And, and then after that was um, Hello Mother. What's his name? Um, oh, uh, Alan Alan Sherman. Alan Sherman. I remember yep. that. And then uh, Steve Martin. When I first started doing comedy, mm -hmm. I had Steve Martin's uh, Comedy Isn't Pretty. Yeah. Comedy isn't and pretty. Was, yeah. Yeah. And I used that, you know, if I would find something funny, I would sit there and try to break out what about that, how, like, what was making me laugh? Like, I was trying to analyze it. Yeah. And it's not so easy, you know? No. Um, like, you just laugh and you go, this is funny, you know? And you, it's like, no. Why is it funny? I was like, I, I don't know. And I said, no, it's funny for a reason. You have to think. You know, you have to analyze. You have to break it out. And so I tried to do that with that album. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how far I got with it, but that was my plan. And um, that was a long time ago. But I guess I figured some things out. Yes, I mean, yeah, when, when you, yeah, I mean, I listened to a lot of comedy stuff when I started. I listened to David Tell's Skinks for the Memories, because I loved that album. I loved Patton Oswalt's uh, first album, Feeling Kind of Patton. And I, and I listened to Don Rickles' Hello Dummy to learn crowd work, you know. And I don't think I, I quite succeeded, but I, I did okay with it. And it's, it, it's, it's pretty interesting because, you know, you're trying to convey your message to your audience. And then you listen to what they, what they did, the message that they're trying to convey to their audience. And you, you, think, you think to yourself, okay, I'm not that guy. I'll never be that guy. However, I got to learn how to be my guy, you know? Exactly. Yep. Yep. You got to figure it out. Like... And who is that guy? That's the tricky part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's identifying it. We had Lily Tomlin's This Is a Recording. That was like the first comedy album I remember and stuff, you know, when she's calling um, uh, Joan Crawford, you know, oh, Mrs. Oh, Crawford, but... the Pepsi company would like to speak with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What a uh, delight she is. Uh, Cheech and Chong's Big Bamboo. Oh, uh, the Big Bamboo, yeah. Mm. I still have every routine memorized. It was so good. You know, it got the rolling paper inside. Um, we had a Richard Pryor album. I can't remember which one, but there was no cover, just the, the inside jacket. They lost the cover, I guess, during their partying days, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love his albums. I do listen to those still. I listen, you know, it's like what we were talking about movies that whenever they come on or you come across them, you just sit and just enjoy them for a while. Yeah. That's how I feel about he He was a huge inspiration for me. Not that you could tell. Everybody. Comedy, but <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody was influenced by Pryor, you know, it's, yeah. he's just one of those guys that just had had a lasting impact, you know? So I was on Facebook recently, and I saw that uh, you had a Bob a Bob Hope moment back in the '90s. I think we may have talked about it before, but I can't remember. It was a a special of his you were on called "The Ladies of Laughter." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yes, I was on that. And I was with, um, let's see, the hosts, the co-hosts were uh, Crystal Bernard. Oh, she's gorgeous. And, yes, and Rue McClellahan. Mm -hmm. And um, the other comics were uh, Wendy Liebman, mm -hmm. Ka Carol Siskin. I, I, um, I know them both. <laughs> Mar Margaret Cho. Margaret Cho. Kathleen Madigan. Mm-hmm. And me. Yeah, that's a great lineup. I think that's right. That's, I can't, yeah. Maybe I have too many, but <laughs> I think those were all on there. I'm not sure. Like I said, everything's foggy anymore. But um, that was a really fun experience because um, I guess, you know, a lot of people, his staff went through a bunch of, um, tapes to listen to comics and then they narrowed it down to 20 to mm -hmm. present to Mr. Hope. That's what they called him. Everybody called him Mr. Hope. Right. Um, and, um, and so he picked us. So that was quite an honor, you know? Um, yeah. and then we went to his house in Burbank, his house, his estate, huge amount of property. He has that, that was a big, um, like, um, an, an office, you know, and you'd like a gated office, you'd come in and then there, he had a rose garden and a pool. And then he had, which I, I guess is common, but I'd never run into it. He has like a public house mm -hmm. on the bottom floor. And then upstairs is his private house. So it's like two different, like downstairs is entertaining purely. Mm -hmm. And there's pictures of him with presidents and, you know, just all kinds of stars and impressive awards and, you know, using crystal bowls that he was presented, you know, to yeah. hold peanut. And, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just, he wasn't there that day, but it was just mm. like pretty cool to be there. And, um, you know, that was that was very fun. So I, I guess we were there for a photo or something. And then we had the photo shoot, which was just Carol. That's what you saw. Carol um, Carol and I were chosen to be on the publicity photo. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and so we, we went there and they set up the shot and went over everything with us. And, and then finally they brought in Mr. Hope. And he was like 89 or something. Oh, and yeah. He was... He was my first impression was I had no idea. I thought he was a tall man. And yeah. <laughs> he was not a tall man not at all. I was like, are you sure this is Mr. Hope? <laughs> I was really surprised because I, I really didn't picture him that, that little. Anyway, he stood between us and, um, and the photographer did his best to hurry things along and, you know, be quick and efficient and everything and then at a certain point he said okay Mr. Hope just a few more and we'll be done and uh, Mr. Hope said nope you got it and he slid off his stool and left and I was like wow that is boss <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. and that uh, George Schlager out. produced it yes yes yeah what a nice man uh, George Schlager was yeah yeah, a comedy king in his own right, just by all, all you know, by all the great work he did producing Laughing and all that. Yes, I know he was. He was pretty cool. He was a very nice man. So that was very fun. Yeah, yeah. I had some good times. Yeah, that's so awesome that you got to do that. Yeah, there was there was a there was a period where Bob Hope and Johnny Carson were feuding because uh, because Johnny thought that that it was time that Hope retired because he kept doing the same special over and over again and telling the same stories over and over again every time he went on his show. <laughs> you know. Oh, uh, oh well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 pretty interesting, but um, yeah. Well, at least Johnny retired at sixty-seven. You know, before you know he got to be Hope's age. <laughs> Tomorrow is National Hickey Day. Have you ever had a hickey? Oh yes, had and given yeah. them. Yes. <laughs> Are I, they still in fashion? I I haven't seen one or had one or given one in a very long time. So I, I don't. I haven't I even thought about them for a very long time. I wouldn't. I mean, 
I wouldn't know, but like, you know, um, I had one once when I was 25. My ex gave me a big one on my neck, and everyone at work ragged on me for a while after that. <laughs> yeah, it's embarrassing. It really is. Yep. It, I, I guess people just get tattoos now. I'm not sure. <laughs> Exactly. I don't know. I don't know how they do anymore. I, I don't even know if people still t know what they are. I guess they still do them. But, I mean, it, it didn't feel good. It I just was sort of a territorial thing, you know. I've tried. I've tried give, uh, giving women them, but, like, I, I never succeed. I'm like, why, oh God, why is it, why, why is it, it, it turning uh, purple-blue, you know? <laughs> Maybe you didn't wait long enough, you know. It doesn't happen right away, does it? No, Maybe it, it, does. it, it, I don't it know. takes a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So, how's stand up been going? I'm having so much fun. I'm really, really enjoying it. Like, so much. Um, I just am getting more and more just so comfortable. Like, I'm always nervous before the show. Like, my, my fellow comedians would go, You're comfortable? You know, because I'm always like, going over my notes and like rocking and like going oh god you know like that agonizing before the show but I'm really having so much fun on stage and um just just loving it and so I'm doing the Borgata I just got that date um mm -hmm. May 10th to the 12th and um that's a great room I love that and I'm I like even, I'm still doing open mics. I go to open mics just because it's fun mm -hmm. and I can work out new stuff and see new comics and see what they're, you know, get inspired by them. And so it's fun. I'm just enjoying it. I I am so proud of you, Anita, because you've come a long way since our first interview in 2018 when it, it seemed like everything was uncertain for you, but you've really, you know, made a quantum leap, and I, I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, 2018 was, I was still in the, yeah, I went through a very rough period, and uh, and so right now, I'm just so grateful. I know good times don't last and hopefully bad times don't either but right yeah. now i know I'm in, I'm in a good spot and i'm just trying to enjoy it as for as and, and long and as well as it lasts and, and wednesday will be six years since we did our first interview too <laughs> wow i can't believe you know that's you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine, Paul Lyons, maybe. I don't know if you know him. Oh, that's, I, you almost knew him, but you Yes, know yes. <laughs> yeah, he, he almost came on with you today. <laughs> right, almost. But, um, yeah, we were, like, he was shocked because I told him, you know, some date, like, uh, like you and I just discussed. And, and he was like, it was that long ago? I thought it was only two years. So, yeah, um, yeah it's just amazing. But it's beautiful here. It's spring in the east coast and it's so pretty and i'm just having a nice time and i'm really appreciating it yeah what wonderful uh so aside from that gig on may 10th are there any others well i just did a dry bar special so um who knows when that will come out because they just taped a lot of people you know yeah. um for a weekend and they did several many weekends of taping so that's a lot of people they have to edit and and they just finished taping the last of the of the weekends that they're doing so um julia waited like almost a year for hers to come out mm. a lot of editing to do so but eventually <laughs> i'll be on dry bar i think i hope oh. and uh yeah so and that was a ton of fun too i had a great time out in utah they were very nice and the crowds were great, and I had a good time. So they, they gotta get you out here in the Bay Area. I think you would do very well out here. I would love to do that, and that's why I'm excited about the dry bar because that's going to be very nice, high quality tape that people can relate to. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah. So I would love to do that. I just I just moved to Modesto last summer, and so like, I, I haven't been to any comedy shows um, yet. But like, yeah, I mean, if they 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 book you, you know, out in the Bay, I'll come see you. 
Okay, yeah, I, I had a good time when I was in San Francisco last, which was a while ago, mm -hmm. um, but very fun clubs. And so, yeah, I, I'm going to try to get out there. I'm spreading my wings. Awesome. I have a joke for you. Okay. Okay, why did the blonde have a bruised belly button? Oh, God. I'm so scared to ask you why. Because her <laughs> boyfriend was blonde. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. You get it? Okay. I just want to put this out there. It wasn't a hickey. <laughs> no, I gather that. I gather that. That's that's lucky. Yes, for her. So. Anita, I love you. Thank you for coming back on, like always, and nerding out with me. Oh, thank you, Tommy. It's always fun, and you have a great day. Yes, you have fun with the shows, and be safe out there. All right, thank you. Take okay. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Anita Wise. Ain't she a sweetheart? I just freaking love her. She is so awesome. I'm so glad that she's having this great, you know, third act of comedy. Second second or third act, whichever way you want to put it. She's so awesome, and she's going to keep going far. I'm just so proud of her. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Where, dudes?